In 2020, it cost more than $447,000 to imprison just one inmate in a New York City jail per year. $447,000. And this is just your run-of-the-mill jail in New York City. Not a maximum security prison where you get sent once you've already been convicted of a crime. Where you can imagine there being a lot more operating expenses. No, but a jail where you go to if you get pulled over for drunk driving or you get caught with some drugs on you and you're awaiting trial. Which, to be fair, does include the infamous Rikers Island Jail, the biggest jail complex in America that is very brutal. If you can survive Rikers Island, you can survive anything. That will average out to $447,000 per year. At that rate, you can live in the world's only 7-star hotel in Dubai, the Burj Al Arab, or the Mandarin Oriental overlooking Central Park in Manhattan, or the La Reserve in Paris if that's more of your style. But in an NYC jail, you're going to have a much better time. This $447,000 price tag is up from the $334,000 it was in 2019. While at the same time, jail population went down and violence went up around the same amount. So there were less inmates to manage, yet the cost went up by over $100,000. That half a million dollars per inmate has to go somewhere. The question is, where? This is the profitable business of the prison industrial complex. Some of the footage you see in this video is from Storyblocks, today's video sponsor. Storyblocks is the all-in-one platform that lets you download unlimited stock video, audio, music, stock images, animations, basically all the assets that you could need to make a video. Storyblocks has them all in one place with a single affordable subscription. And that's what I love about Storyblocks. A lot of other platforms offer you just music or just stock video with a subscription. Or worse yet, some charge you per download. With Storyblocks, you get everything with unlimited downloads all in one very reasonable subscription. So you can create eye-popping stuff like this. It's faster and easier than ever before. And the best part, if you're brand new to editing, Storyblocks even offers an easy-to-use video editor that lets you add content directly from their library, intuitively edit, then you can download your new video in all the important aspect ratios. So if you're an aspiring creator, marketer, or editor that wants to make videos faster than ever before, pause the video and go to storyblocks.com slash jaketrend right now with the link below to sign up for their unlimited all-access plan. There's no commitment and you can cancel at any time. That's storyblocks.com slash jaketrend with the link below. Around the world, there are over 10 million people held in prison, with the leader of the prison industrial complex being none other than the United States. Yes, the land of the free, home of the brave has not only the highest number of prisoners, but also has the most prisoners per capita. The US shares the stage right above El Salvador, Turkmenistan, and Thailand in per capita terms. In terms of just the raw number of prisoners, the US has around 2.1 million people incarcerated, followed by China at 1.7 million, Brazil at 800,000, Russia at 500,000, and India at around 470,000. But these numbers can be deceiving. See, on paper, China has only 400,000 less prisoners than the US, a pretty small margin. But China is also pretty well known for releasing false data to the world since their government has total control over their numbers. China has also been routing up a Muslim minority that lives in their borders called Uyghurs and throwing them into prison camps, labor camps. But instead of labeling them as prison labor camps, they refer to them as vocational, educational, and training centers. Some estimates put the number of Uyghurs locked up in these training centers at 1 million. And I highly doubt this 1 million or whatever the real number is of vocational trainees are included in their prisoner statistics. And if that's the case, China could easily overtake the US for the most humans imprisoned. Definitely doesn't take away from the US's giant prison population, but still important to keep in mind. But why? What's the point of having all these people held in captivity that you have to feed, manage, and somewhat provide for? Simple. It's pretty profitable for almost all the parties involved. And at least in the US's case, this business, this pipeline if you want to call it that, starts at the street level. Mm. 
Most people know that in America, you're innocent until proven guilty, but not your property. Yes, in America, police can take your property without ever arresting you or charging you with a crime. Carrying too much cash? Police can accuse you of selling drugs or laundering money and seize it. No seize conviction. it without ever taking you to court. And police departments around the country have discovered this is a really good way to raise money. As long as they can claim that they suspect your house, your car, your jewelry, your cash might be connected to a crime, they can come and take it. They know better? <laughs> uh, under asset forfeiture, the government doesn't need anything but suspicion to seize your property and keep it for themselves. Police then get to keep the toys they like, auction off the rest, and use the money for whatever they want. Salaries, equipment, trips, whatever. When the police seize things, they get to keep the money. They can use it for salaries, they can use it for trips. And One police department used the money to buy a margarita machine, but I, I gather that most of the time they're using it for police equipment. As one police chief put it, it's kind of like pennies from heaven, you know, it gets you a, a toy or something that you need, is, is the way we typically look at it. There's some limitations on it, you know, it's actually there's not really on the forfeiture stuff. And the great part? Since this is a civil case, not a criminal case, the court doesn't have to provide the person you took from with a lawyer if they can't afford one, so they have to fight it themselves, pay their own fees, prove that their property is innocent after it's been taken away. So most of the time, they just end up giving up. Under asset forfeiture, law enforcement seize your property without arresting you, charging you, or convicting you of a crime. The guy whose stuff is taken, he yes. can fight in court to get it back. He has to prove that it's legally there, and that can cost him 10,000 or 100,000 in legal fees. Most people just give up and lose their stuff. It's your property that gets charged, and you must prove that it isn't guilty. And with this incentive of asset forfeiture in place, police departments have gotten very clever with it. You could seize a car full of drugs, or you can let the drug dealer sell the drugs and seize a car full of money. So which sides of the highways do you think police set stings up on? They set up stings on the side of the highways where they know the drug dealers are leaving town with cars full of money, not the sides where the, where the drug dealers are coming into town with cars full of drugs. And it's gotten so profitable that by 2014, law enforcement took more stuff from people than actual burglars. You know, Congress gave asset forfeiture to the government to prosecute the war on drugs. And this has turned into a massive rev revenue stream. And after 40 years of a war on drugs, we still have drugs and drug dealers. You know, the only thing we've really forfeited is their rights to property and to liberty. All this happens without requiring an arrest, which brings us to the next step in the pipeline, the actual prisons and jails. If you want to be a prison entrepreneur, the business model of prisons is pretty simple. When the war on drugs was at its peak, government prisons were getting too crowded and couldn't keep up. So private companies pitched to the government that if you contract the work to us, we can build the prisons you need faster, make them safer at a lower cost. A very compelling argument. So the government said yes, even though the last part about lowering costs didn't pan out so well. Private prison companies could build facilities faster without voter approval. They also claimed they could provide a higher quality at a lower price. So today, the job of the prison entrepreneur is to secure government contracts to build and run prisons. And the prisons you run, you charge a daily fee per prisoner. But as always, we don't call this rate your per inmate fee because that would come off a little too inhumane to the public. So like all questionable things, you obfuscate it with obscure terminology like per diem or mandates which is just a fancy name for what you charge per prisoner per day. So if you want to make more money, all you have to do is either increase the price each prisoner pays per day, lower your operating costs, or increase the number of customers in your facilities. But in reality, private prisons only make up around 8% of the industry, which is not a lot. So why do public prisons and jails like the ones in New York City still cost so much? Simple. It's the same reason why San Francisco spent $16 million to set up 262 tents for homeless people. Not 262 homes, but a literal tent in a white square painted on the floor, which comes out to $61,000 per tent per year, which is 2.5 times more than what it costs to rent a one-bedroom apartment in the same city. 
there's so many scandals. By the way, there was one just reported in the San Francisco Chronicle about how the city of San Francisco paid $16 million to pay for something like 260 tents or something tents. like that. Why? Because someone's got to provide the city with tents at inflated prices. Someone's got to paint the squares on the floor at inflated prices. Because why not? The government's paying. They're not going to blink an eye at an extra few thousand dollars. It's not their money. And it makes them look good that they're caring for homeless people. The same is true for public prisons. Sure, the government is the one running them, but they still have to buy uniforms, food from other contractors to keep the show going. So we covered the police. We covered the prisons. But there's one more part to this prison economy that we haven't covered yet. The cheap labor. Let's say you're running a company that needs some simple manual labor. Maybe the sewing, cleaning, or manufacturing jobs. On one hand, you could hire a normal free citizen, but then you have to pay them at market wages, maybe offer benefits, 401ks, deal with labor unions. It's just a pain. On the other hand, some of these jobs can be outsourced to cheaper countries. But now you have the added layer of complexity of dealing with shipping and all those logistics. It's also a pain. Enter prison labor. They're domestic, you pay them pennies on the dollar, and they can't complain. Now, I am not saying that if I needed workers like these, I would choose this latter option, but it's definitely compelling. And this is another huge incentive to keep this train going. 10 million people incarcerated around the world is one heck of a workforce. Most prisoners in the US work these basic jobs. Same thing with the trainees in China's labor camps. And this is what happens when all these different parties come together. Police, prosecutors, public prisons, private prisons, government contractors, companies that hire prison labor. But to be fair, some prisons are a lot better than others in how much they cost and how they treat their inmates. Like this private prison CNBC covered that charges only $51 per prisoner per day and looks pretty decent. At least what they showed on camera. And there are a lot of prisoners that I would be happy to continue paying a reasonable amount to keep them behind bars. But $447,000 per inmate per year in NYC? In what world does that make sense? A lot of people blame private prisons because they're an easy target. But again, they only manage 8% of the inmates in America. If you ban private prisons, the exact same problems would just move back into the public prisons. So what about taking a look at the legal system that makes this mass incarceration possible? Or the 300,000 plus federal crimes that are on the books? Or the fact that 98% of those federal crimes aren't even written by elected officials? 300,000 plus. That's just federal. It's way, way too big. Part of that is because we don't take any old or outmoded laws off the book. That's not how it works in practice. At the federal level, 98% of criminal laws are not passed by elected representatives. And when you give the government this kind of power, they're going to exercise it at some point. People commit crimes all the time without knowing it because it's impossible to know what sort of behavior is criminal. When they get labeled as criminals, that stays with them through their whole life. So I will leave you with this. There is no way to rule innocent men. The only power any government has is the power to crack down on criminals. Well, when there are enough criminals, one makes them. One declares so many things to be a crime that it becomes impossible for men to live without breaking laws. Who wants a nation of law-abiding citizens? What's there in that for anyone? But just pass the kind of laws that can neither be observed nor enforced nor objectively interpreted, and you create a nation of lawbreakers. And then you cash in on guilt. enjoyed this video, don't forget about Storyblocks because they help make videos like this possible. Storyblocks is the go-to place for unlimited stock video, animation, stock music, stock images, everything you need to create videos all in one affordable, simple subscription. So make your life easier and this channel's life easier by going to storyblocks.com slash jaketrend with the link below to sign up right now. There's no commitment, you can cancel at any time at storyblocks.com slash jaketrend with the link below. If you are new here, we make video essays just like this one every single week for free, so you might as well subscribe. We're almost at half a million subscribers, which I'm pretty pumped about. So click that red button below. And if you want more behind the scenes stuff, day in the life kind of stuff, lots of business memes, you can follow me on Instagram at jaketrend.io. We have a ton of fun over there. That is going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome. I've been Jake. Stay dangerous out there, and I will see you guys in the next one. Stay out of prison too. Thank you.